Hello, I am Courtney Act and welcome to One Plus One. A decade ago, Pallavi Sharda defied the odds to become the first Australian actress of Indian origin to break through in Bollywood. Intelligent, thoughtful and driven, Pallavi is not afraid to take risks or stand up for what she believes in. Her career has gone beyond Bollywood to Hollywood, the UK and Australia. And we sat down to have a talk about her journey from Melbourne to Mumbai and back again, and her fight for greater diversity on screens. Pallavi Sharda, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Now, I know you're an actor, but your uh, love of performing arts started out in dance. That's right. Tell me about that. So I grew up in Melbourne, yep. Australia, um, and I was a part of a very vibrant Indian community where the performing arts were really valued. And I remember being really young and my parents taking me to a dance performance called Bharatanatyam. It's a classical Indian dance form, which is... I can never talk about it without <laughs> moving my arms. Um, really symmetrical based on Hindu mytho mythological stories. And I just looked at it and it was magical. And when I was three, my parents took me to my first dance class in the Collingwood College Canteen in mm -hmm. Melbourne. And that was it. Was never looked back. I feel like I have similar childhood experiences. When you say Collingwood Canteen, I can just picture suburbia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was my life. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't very, wasn't very pretty. I remember that from my childhood too. And it was your dad who introduced you to Hindi films? It was. He was a big film buff and obviously having two young kids growing up in Australia, one of the priorities for my parents was that we could speak Hindi. And my grandmother was a professor of Hindi, so language was a big part of our family tradition. And he loved films, so he introduced me to the old classics and the newer kind of contemporary films that were coming out in the early 90s and you'd get these VHS tapes and you just watch the same film about 18 times. And I found these sort of goddess-like women who were performing, you know, in rain sequences and um, in the fields and emoting with their eyes. And I was like, this is magic. Mm. How do I do this when I grow up? And that's where the sparkle began? That's where it began. Nice. It's interesting with um, some migrant families that there's like, uh, an importance placed on culture and then others um, it's about assimilation and, and I know my parents both emigrated from Europe and I don't know anything about their countries yes. or their cultures really. Yes. I thought that um, uh, beetroot and liverwurst sandwiches were a traditional Danish meal. Um, canned beetroot? <laughs> yeah, canned beetroot. <laughs> um, but that, that importance they placed on culture sounds like such an important thing that would give you such a a rich connection. Absolutely. And I think my parents were so rooted in who they were before they came to Australia. And I think something that contributed to them being able to hold on to that was perhaps the way they came to Australia as migrants. They were skilled migrants that were almost invited here in the 1980s. And so I don't think they felt that pressure. They didn't feel this notion that you know, uh, this government is endowing upon us some great favour by allowing us yeah. in, which unfortunately is the case for many migrant communities. There is that sense of having to feel grateful for being given a place here. And I just think they were very sure of themselves. And I, my brother and I both were quite interested in, you know, what did it mean to look this way and to go home and hear the sounds of Hindi and hear our parents speak in a different um, accent. Mm how can we also be part of that? Mm. So that became our priority because the Australian, the Australiana was happening anyway. Mm. We were going to primary school and, you know, getting weird calling, being called Pavlova, which is what I was called <laughs> when I was a kid. Nice. Yeah. Tell me, um, Hindi films, Bollywood films, can yes. you explain to me if there's a difference, what the difference is? So I guess Bollywood is the 
is the name given to Hindi films um, because they're made in Bombay. So Bombay just was like, oh, Hollywood, Bollywood. In Lahore, in Pakistan, it's Lollywood. Ah. In South India, and the Telugu films and the Tamil films are Tollywood. The Malayali films are Mollywood. I see a theme. <laughs> I see the theme. So, so Bollywood's not a place in India. It's not like Hollywood in LA. Um, but it does signify Hindi language films. But more specifically, the films that used the musical genre. Mm. But I do think that it's important to acknowledge that India has very vast film industries and it's really diverse. You know, being Indian is not a monolithic concept and that's reflected in all of our filmmaking. And so for you, it was Bollywood that spoke to you. Yes. It was, <laughs> you were like, I want, I want that. That's I where I want to be. I want to dance around a tree. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think being a dancer and, and loving, you know, the, the various facets of what it meant to be Indian were intriguing to me. And the fact that, you know, a, a Punjabi person had certain characteristics or a Bengali person had certain ca characteristics. It was like a theatre within, theatre of culture, really. And I guess as a young person, like, there probably weren't many places or any places in Australian pop culture to see yourself reflected. And those would have been such important touchstones. Absolutely. Um, I love that you phrased that question and I didn't have to say it. <laughs> That's very rare. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the only time that I started to witness a sense of being represented in non-Indian cinema was when crossover cinema came to Australia. And then, you know, obviously Gurinda Chadha made Bend It Like Beckham 20 years ago and I was at high school and all of a sudden girls were coming up to me and being like, Pallavi, did you watch that movie? She looks like you, you know. Oh, do you like soccer? Whatever it was. Yeah. And it was an honour to work with her, I must say, a few years ago because I think it's the first time I'd worked with a woman or any person who shared my heritage and that dual kind of perspective mm. when it came to culture as a creator mm. and, and could imbue what we were creating with that gaze. I want to talk about all of that stuff, but I also want to know a bit more about um, you uh, as a, a younger person in Australia. I know that you did a, a double degree, a <laughs> fast track double degree. Tell me what that means, first oh. of all. Oh God, it means being a little bit insane and losing your adolescence. Um, but something I'm really grateful for and proud of, I actually, I started university when I was 16 um, and started a law degree and a media and communications degree and a diploma in French at the University of Melbourne. And I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Just... I'm sensing some quintessential uh, minority exceptionalism. Pretty much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for just saying it. I love this interview so much. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's inherent and you can't really help it. Both my parents were fascinating people and also university professors with PhDs and I was a smart kid. I mean, I should, I'm not afraid to say that. I was on a scholarship, academic scholarship to a really great school. Um, I skipped year nine and finished high school when I was 16. And They should sell this to kids. You can do less school if you're really good at I it. If you're really good at it. I know, I don't know. The thing is, I was really good at math and then I became terrible, which is like, I have for shame on the Indian right. community. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because it was the point where I was in grade three, my dad was like, A square plus B square equal. I'm like, dad, I can't, like, let's not do calculus. I'm eight. Um, but he said, he'd always come home and say things like, I told all my students in the lecture today, my daughter can do this calculus and she's eight. And I was like, that's pressure, dad, yeah. stop it. But I did, I loved it. And it was, you know, I was sort of a lonely kid. So I think school was this fun thing for me. Um, Maybe not socially, but I loved my teachers. I was really lucky to have great teachers in both primary and secondary school. And they really inspired me and encouraged me and never made me feel like I was a minority kid or anything like that. So it was a very safe space. But there was a slight longing to start my life. There's a big pressure, I think, so often for um, people of minorities to be exceptional because there's you're almost like representing your your yes. whole people. Yes, And absolutely. that's a lot of pressure for a young person, for anyone. It, it is, and I think, you know, these are concepts that I've only, in the last sort of five years, started to get my head around because I've retroactively looked at my life mm. and been like, why did I push myself so hard? Mm. Because it, I didn't go out at, at 18, 19 and get pissed, mm. you know, on, in the uni square. I was doing nine subjects a semester kind of thing. 
um, because I was trying to get to the next phase of my life, whatever that looked like, and to get to a place where I could contribute to society and the, the, the cause of representation when no one was talking about this. Mm. Because I was told as I was studying media and communications that I would never be able to be a broadcast journalist in Australia because I couldn't dye my hair blonde. I was told when I did part-time acting school at 18 that I would never get work on Australian screens because I had brown skin. Wow. So that really... What does that do to you? Well, I went on this wild ride and left right. and, and went to India because I was like, oh, that's fine. I'll fit in somewhere in India. But in hindsight, I realised that it, it, created, it created a very permanent sense of I'm outside of the nucleus mm. and I have to work so hard to penetrate that membrane mm. and you know this idea of working twice as hard for half as much and that doesn't go away once you've experienced that mm. because um, I've also witnessed how my parents operated in their workplaces and in you know traumas that my mum went through as an Indian woman in engineering and you start to collect all of these little pieces of information. I think it's the cumulative effect of that messaging that makes you go, all right, you cannot stop, you can't take your foot off the pedal because the, the basis against upon which you're building is, is so strong and it's so uh, guarded. And, and then it just creates this adrenaline and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and then you hope that one day you can it can be easy and breezy, but I don't quite think we're there yet. So it did, it did inject me with a lot of purpose. But I will say that as a young woman, it didn't upset me, which I think it should have. Mm. And I think that's because it had been so normalised. I looked at these people, my teachers, and I didn't think they were being mean. I didn't think that they were being racist. I didn't think they were being horrible. I thought, well, that's kind of them to give me a reality check so I don't spend two, three years fighting this ceiling. Mm. So it's a pretty nuanced knock-on effect, um, which I'm still grappling with because I ended up having to leave. And so what was it like arriving in Mumbai? Was it what you expected? Well, I didn't have any context of Mumbai, really, because my parents are from New Delhi and I just assumed it was like Delhi. But Mumbai is the New York of India and there's high-rises, there's 25 million people on a 40-kilometre stretch of land. And so there is no space anywhere. You're just staring at other humans all the time. And I love that about it. Um, but it's a hustler city. And I was I'm not really a hustler by nature because I'd been taught to wait my turn. But when I got to India, I think, you know, the very Australian sense of let's just sort of stay back and not get too much in people's faces, that really overcame who I was. And, I think I'm always my Indian self shrouds who I am in Australia and my Australian self shrouds who I am in India. That's the beauty and the peril of dual heritage. And I was sort of quite softly, softly when I would talk about my training to people and I would talk about my background um, because I think I was taught subliminally that there was an ugliness to a woman being really forthright. and. I think also the language with which I articulated what I was there to do was very intimidating to the people in front of me because I was able to just say it. And there was no begging, there was no um, buttering up. It was like, this is who I am, this is what I've always dreamt of, this is all the work I've put into it and this is the work I'm prepared to do. And for a lot of people that wasn't the language that a lot of young women in their early 20s were equipped with because it was a time where that wasn't encouraged. But it sounds like it must have worked because you were cast opposite one of Bollywood's biggest stars in a, a huge film. I met some anomalies along the way. Right. And for me, the anomalies were very far and few between, but when they came, they were serious screen lights because I was able to go very far with those opportunities. I had a director who was traditionally an outsider and he wanted to cast an outsider and he auditioned hundreds of girls and I was the one that got through. But that was, I'd already been in India for a couple of years and I'd already experienced quite a bit of hardship before that opportunity came about. Was there fun and excitement in like getting the call to say you'd got the role, being there, filming it? Um, tell me a bit about, I imagine there was excitement in that. Oh, I'm, I'll never forget it. I can see it like it's a movie. For, I, I used to drive an old vintage ambassador in India and an ambassador is like, it was the old taxi 
and I was driving my ambassador along Juhu Road, which is a seaside road, and I got the call from the director and he said, you were going to be the heroine in XYZ film opposite one of the biggest stars in the country. And I did, I screamed, mm -hmm. screamed. And I turned on the music and I cried and I had a drive from wherever I was to my apartment. And yeah, I, I still remember that moment very clearly. And it was a like vindication for mm -hmm. all of my childhood dreaming. Which must have been wonderful. Absolutely. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It was impossible, unbelievable. Mm. And really, statistically, now when I look at it, I think, you know, they say that a thousand people arrive in Mumbai every day to become an actor. Mm. So that's the competition that you're up against. Um, so, yeah, I give myself a pat on the back. Yeah. But I've heard that the people who are in the house are not going to be able to do it. What is it that you love about Bollywood? I love the, the joy yeah. and the, the celebration that it feels like it is whenever you're on set and there's a sense of family and love and, you know, Indian culture is very warm. You can't walk onto a set without everyone being concerned about whether or not you've eaten well. And it feels like coming home. And to have that in the workplace where you get to, like, go and play and, and perform and dance and emote and, and be messy, you know, that's what Bollywood is, and I, I really miss it, actually, now. And I'm very lucky that the roles that I got to play subsequently have been really meaty. And, you know, both films that I did after Bishram were period dramas, and one was set during the British Raj era, and the other one was set during the time of partition between India and Pakistan. I played a sex worker who was stuck at a brothel that sat on the line of partition. And I think what's been really fascinating is learning about the history of my heritage nation through film and the fact that it can be a tool of disseminating, you know, historical data, but Because you think of Bollywood human. as being so light and fun. Absolutely. And, but there's also a side that is informing people. Absolutely. And I grew up watching those films. So to be able to contribute to that as someone who was so inspired by that as a young girl, it was, it was a real honour. Mm. And then just the joy of people watching the yeah. films like I imagine I mean you can't help but feel joy when you watch some of these elaborate dance scenes oh, yeah. and Your heart the, sings. yeah there's so <laughs> much fun to it like and and I think sometimes because we value academia and things like that sometimes I forget oh actually making people smile yeah. and making people laugh is actually also one of the greatest things that we can do I think you know they say you know entertainment for entertainment's sake as if it's a bad thing and I'm like no it's you know Bollywood is escapism in its traditional form and that's why I loved it it took me to this magical realm where you do you forget everything that's happening and you're transported <laughs> How hard is it for a foreigner to be arriving to try and make it? So I'm kind of like a pseudo foreigner. I think people didn't really know how to place me because I look very Indian. I sounded very Indian. My mannerisms were very Indian. My code switching is so intense. Mm -hmm. if, you, if we, if I come an to actor. India, I know, right? And, and I've grown up in an Indian household, and because I was such a chameleon, people couldn't really place me as a foreigner unless I said I grew up in Australia. Blah 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 blah. And a lot of the foreign women that have come to us to India to work in in Bollywood were fair skinned, mixed race. Some, in some cases, not of Indian heritage at all, but have features which could pass as Indian. And they really pandered to the colorism, which is very prevalent in, you know, in Indian culture in general, which is fair skin is desirable, dark skin is not. And I was considered a dark skinned woman who'd arrived in India. And people would say to my face, sorry, you're dusky. I don't think you're gonna have much of a chance. And I was like, dusky, you mean like the night? Mm. Like, what are you talking about? Mm. And as is, Sorry, is the colorism a, a hangover from the West? I would say so. I mean, I think that's a big part of it because the, the South Indian, um, the South Indian principalities operated, you know, independently of what was happening in the North traditionally. Whereas all of a sudden, it's united as one country, and you have fair-skinned overlords mm. who are in charge of you. And I think that the trickle-down effect of that is undeniable mm. globally. I mean. That's, th that's happened throughout the ages when it comes to colonialism. It's that the white man has conquered 
the black or the brown person. So you, you can't, I don't think you can separate that history with what's happening on the ground now. And I do think that, you know, today it just means that when I am a community member within a broader Indian or South Asian community, yes, it has fostered a lot of empathy because I understand that the community itself sometimes can create this polarisation and can perpetuate some of this stratification that I think there's no place for anymore. Mm. Um, the film that you're in, Besharam, yes. came out mm -hmm. and what happened? It came out in 4,000 screens globally and um, what happened? A lot of things happened. I was all of a sudden known all over India as the Besharam girl and the Besharam girl also translates as the shameless girl because Besharam means shameless. And I remember my mum's mum saying, so could we, could we change the name of the title because, you know, in Village Hindi, because shameless is the worst thing that you could be. And I kind of have worn that with a lot of pride because I've often been called Bisharam as a denigration in my childhood and growing up. And it was a very Bisharam act to go to India and to, to, to want to be an actress and break into this industry. But it was a very tough aftermath because I was trying to break many moulds in terms of being an outsider in that industry. I think I faced, you know, a somewhat misogynistic aftermath. Because the assumption was that the only way that a woman can get a film of this stature on this level is if she has Compromised. Used to have feminine, feminine wiles. Well, as they like to say in India, compromised. Mm -hmm. And that was a question I was asked very often. Wow. Will you compromise? And that is a euphemism for will you, will you sleep with someone for work? You were <laughs> asked this by the media or by people in the casting rooms? Casting rooms, producers. Wow. Um, I mean, we know it happens those sorts of conversations and those sorts of acts, but it is still fascinating. And also to know that there's a word, will you compromise? Will you compromise? And I was considered the uncompromising woman, which is also why I found it tough to get work. I was also the girl that read her contracts, which were very... I happened to have a, a law yeah, background. They, well, that was it. They were like, isn't that that girl that thinks a lot? Yeah. And I was gaslit for being a thinker. Mm. So I was gaslit pretty heavily in my time in India and I think that while I had been very, very headstrong and really pushed my way through, it was tough to kind of get to the point where you've achieved this impossible childhood dream and then feel like that might still be the case. Um, it was pretty heartbreaking. So you came back to Australia yes. and you found success being cast as the lead in the ABC drama Pulse, available on iView. Um, <laughs> as a doctor. As a doctor. Yes. That, is that without nuance? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I remember saying to my agents, don't send me a script if I have to wear a lab coat or a stethoscope. But there was a moment where I went, okay, everyone's a doctor in this, so it's fine. You're not just playing the doctor. You're not just playing the in. Indian doctor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that was a great experience. I think it was my first experience in, on Australian TV sets and it was a real learning curve very, very early on. You ordered drugs for a patient without first talking it over with me. Her kidney was packing it in. Potentially life-threatening drugs. Well, I tried calling you first. Not good enough. Did you at least clear it with Berger first? We've got a problem here. Coming back, there were challenges though. There was challenges when you can see that perhaps the lighting isn't right for your skin tone or people are not used to making up someone of colour. Mm. Um, or you get comments that are a little bit awkward and you have to placate the situation when someone says, don't worry, I've worked on a Thai person before, so I know how to do your face, and I'm just there going, it's uh, not the same. But, um, which is a nuance maybe a, a lot of people don't understand, but I know, doing makeup. Yes. Simple things like makeup, hair texture Absolutely. are things that might not seem like a big deal to a white person because it's not something that has ever been a consideration in their life. Yes. But at every opportunity that your skin colour becomes something that's a stumbling point for a makeup artist, yes. it can wear you down, right? Yes, absolutely. And it becomes a sort of a PTSD repeat cycle because mm. you're there going, OK, I need to talk about the fact that I'm different again. I need to talk about the specificity of my needs. I need to not be annoying. I need to not be too much. I need to be palatable within the space that I've been given. I need to be grateful for being here all at once. And yet I need to do my job feeling comfortable and feeling confident. Mm. So it's a really tough tightrope. You left Australia because there weren't enough good roles for South Asian women on television here. Now you've come back. Have things changed? 
I think they have, uh, substantially, just by virtue of the fact that I'm here working. I came to shoot the 12 on Foxtel. I've just finished shooting in Toronto. I mean, it's not an Australian project, it's a US Netflix project called Wedding Season, in which I'm the lead. And it's the first time that we're gonna see a rom-com with a full South Asian cast. So the, the representation, which is also being led a lot in the UK and the US, is something that now I think is accepted here. And I'm just so looking forward to writing content and to being a creator in this country and to bringing along amazing you know, other people that haven't had those opportunities and the new voices that feel a little disenfranchised and saying, we can do it too, guys. Mm. How do you pay it forward for those voices at the moment? Well, I think there's a lot of mentorship. I think that that's the main role that I play is making sure that if anyone ever contacts me, if anyone ever has any questions, that I am there to answer them because I did not have that at all. And in fact, when I sought out mentors, both in India and Australia when I was young, I was faced with a pretty heavy brick wall. So I know that sometimes a conversation and that feeling that someone is seeing you and listening to you can really impact whether or not you take the next step forward. So for me, even if I can't be of substantive help in that moment and say, here, I'm writing a script, would you like to be in it? It's making sure that that person doesn't stop in their path. Mm. And it sounds like then the future is about taking that leadership role when it comes to creating content. Absolutely. I'm, I'm developing a few scripts at the moment, although not spending enough time writing them at the moment. Um, You're too busy being I, on the television. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's really hard. Um, but I, and I also think there's a really strong role to be played, you know, by cultural diplomacy in the bilateral relationship between India and Australia, which is politically quite important at the moment. We're talking about geopolitics and maritime activity, but what of identity consciousness on the ground for the diaspora? What about creating that intercultural dialogue um, between artists and between society, societal members? So for me, that is the role that I think that I can play and I have played. It's just about having institutional support for a change and not sort of being this lone soldier who's uh, expected to come speak on a panel every now and then because it makes people look good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the thing about, about like diversity and representation is sometimes it's performative. Absolutely. But I would rather performative inclusion than no inclusion at all. Exactly. But yeah. hopefully the performativity is a step to Thank authentic you. inclusion. I don't need to do this interview. I'm like, can you just, I love it. I love it. you just speak my language. I, it's exactly right. And I often say the word diversity serves to just have an othering effect as much as any other behaviour. However, I do think that it is needed. We just need to catalyse this phase mm. where we need this language to help people get their heads around all these things that we yeah. haven't bothered with. And then we can go into normalising this plurality without still having to talk about us and them and still having to be like, oh, look at that diverse person or we've got so many diverse people on our panel. I'm like, you might as well have just said that Indian girl from, you know, yeah. X, Y, Z. So, yeah, I think we can be on that road to, to just normalising very soon. It sounds like there's so many seeds of hope and uh, now it's just about watering them and helping them to go onto that tree that you don't just dance around. No. That become wonderful support well, systems. Well, Pallavi means newborn leaf, so. There you go. <laughs> well, Pallavi, thank you so much for joining me on One Plus thank One. Thank you very much. Thank you.